Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. you to stand if you are able or may your spirit rise with us as we gather in your presence holy one speak to us in the decisions that lie before us or when the path or direction we should take seems uncertain guide us when it feels like we've lost more than we can bear Comfort us in our grieving, God. Do not leave us there. When we feel empty and that we've spiritually come up short, poor in spirit, fill our emptiness and lead us to fuller life abundant. When people mock or criticize our faith, help us to find a voice to speak truth in love and to hold our convictions, even when they may be attacked and scrutinized or scoffed at. When we believe, but don't feel very blessed. When we pray, but don't always feel heard. When we try to act with kindness, but are sometimes met with cruelty. Remind us that we are beloved, and that this kingdom prayed for is here and alive and well, something prayed for that we daily seek to participate in. Amen. Please stay standing and join in singing our opening song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. The lyrics will be on the screens. Ah 
to be seated, unless, of course, you're Michaela. And then I invite you to come forward to share with your effervescent spirit about outdoor ministry. Good morning. So I'm talking about Tower Hill. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, usually I'm too tall, but now I'm too short. So Tower Hill is a really great experience. Last, You might know that last year was my first year there, and, well, last, my first week. But, yeah, it was amazing. I met new people, and they were all super kind. We Some activities that we did, was, we did a shaving cream fight, so I recommend bringing a poncho. We climbed Mount Baldy, and we got to jump down it. We climbed up and down. We swam in Lake Michigan. It was all super safe. And younger kids, like from, I think, six years to seven, maybe eight, they would be there from Wednesday to Friday, and then older kids would be there Monday or Sunday for, through Friday. But yeah, it was all super safe. The food was really good. It was amazing. Yeah. If the children would like to come up for the children's message, please join in singing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Okay. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Everybody good? The song is bad. How many of you guys played in the snow a little bit this week? Me. Did anybody play in the snow? Me. Did you go sled riding? Yes. The little snowman, snow fort? It was no freezing. Snowman. Did anybody throw any snowballs? A few of you. I threw it at the ground. At the ground. Okay. All right. All right. Now, boys and girls, today we're talking in church about Jesus is his first sermon. The first time he talks to people, he talks to them in Matthew's gospel from a hillside. And he tells the people all the ways that they're blessed. But it's a little bit confusing because one of the things that Jesus says is, you're blessed when you do the right thing, but people make fun of you for it. When you, when you have your faith in God, but people make fun of you for it. So I'm going to give you an example, okay? So if I found this wallet, all right, and I looked in the wallet. Is there any money in this wallet? There's a lot of money. Wow! <laughs> Which is unusual for Pastor Scott. But yeah, there's some money in here, right? So... But if I found this wallet and I was all by myself at the park playing, I was in the playground and I found the wallet by the bench in the park and I looked around, there was nobody around and I looked in the wallet and I thought, I saw that it belonged to somebody, right? I saw a name in there, but oh my goodness, there's, we could buy a lot of ice cream with this money, couldn't we? Uh, yeah. Crap it though because I mean, there are so many witnesses right now, so. Well, sorry. I'm, right, that's true, that's true. Sorry. That's true. But if I was all by myself, the temptation might, me, might be to do what? Steal it. To keep it for myself. Now, would that be the right thing to do, boys and girls? What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? Find the right person. Find somebody and tell them that you found it? Yeah. Yeah. You would try to find the person who it belonged to and give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that would be the right thing to do, right? Even if nobody was looking around. Did you ever have a situation in school, maybe, where somebody did something that was not very nice, and you said, hey, that's, you shouldn't be making fun of that person, or you, you shouldn't say those things. Those are unkind things. Did you ever do that in school? Maybe stand up to a bully or somebody who's being cruel? Now, were there people who made fun of you for that? Yes. Or people who gave you a hard time for it? Or people who didn't want to speak to you anymore? Yes. Yeah. That's kind of tough, isn't it? Yes. So sometimes, sometimes it's hard to do the right thing because other people might not agree with you or even they might not even like you for it. And Jesus says, you know what? God wants you to do the right thing no matter what. Even if sometimes it's unpopular, even if sometimes people make fun of you, 
because God's with you. And God says, I see what you're doing, and what you're doing is the right thing. And I love you for that. So keep doing the right thing, even when you're the only person maybe at, at a time doing the right thing. Because sometimes it's not always easy to do the right thing. Even the adults out here, if you look around, how many of you think sometimes it's not easy to do the right thing? That's a lot of hands, boys and girls. <laughs> So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily get easier when you're older. You still have to make those decisions every day. And God says, Jesus is reminding people, you know what? Still do the right thing even when it's difficult because God calls you God's treasure, God's beloved, God's blessed ones. And God knows us by name. Will you join me in saying a word of prayer? God, I thank you for these boys and girls because I know that they try a lot of days in school when it's difficult, where somebody's making fun of somebody or somebody's being not so nice or a bully, it's not always easy to speak up or to say the right, or to say, stand up for what is right. So give them courage and remind them that they are surrounded in your love. Guide them and watch over them and help them to do what you would have us to do. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and in his love. Amen. Okay, guys, keep having fun in the snow, and we'll see you next time, all right? Please join in singing verse 2 of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. The first reading today is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come to, before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for the tra my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord, as you looked out from the mountain upon a people gathered there eager to hear what you had to say, you called them blessed, grateful, beloved. Then you said things like poor in spirit and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and when we mourn and meek and when people persecute you. We say those words and they sound so poetic and beautiful. But when we think about what they mean, they're pretty jarring. The world doesn't seem to always feel very blessed when we're mourning. People are persecuting us or cruel or dispirited. What do these beatitudes mean? Holy Spirit, move in us and to us, speak to us, guide us, and remind us of the kingdom values you have and those we strive for. That all, it might not always run parallel with those the world gives us. Be with us in those moments and remind us of your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit? Really? The meek, the merciful. It seems to me that in the world, blessed are the powerful. Blessed are the winners. Blessed are the athletically gifted, the beautiful, those who never are lonely, those who never have trouble getting a date, those who are wealthy and never have to worry about putting a meal on their table or whether they have a roof over their head. Blessed are those when people like you never have a bad thing to say about you. Am I wrong? So, these words from the Beatitudes are probably familiar to most of you. Maybe you've read them a hundred times, heard sermons on them again and again. But I want you to try with me to step into that first century. You've heard about Jesus based on people's gossip and word of tongue, a word of mouth saying, the lame walk, 
Blind people are healed. People who have been sick or with affliction are doing better because of this Yeshua of Nazareth, this Jesus. And he's speaking here in Bethsaida on the hillside by Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. Let's go. Let's go hear what he's got to say. Maybe he's the prophet that Moses has predicted. Maybe he's the Messiah. And so they all gather. And Jesus leads off with things like, blessed are you when you've suffered a tremendous loss in your life. What? Blessed are you when people give you a hard time because of the convictions you have with God. Huh? Blessed are you when you're a peacemaker. Well, these Romans have destroyed much of what we hold dear, and the world's a violent place. How are we blessed if we're peacemakers? How are we blessed if we're grieving and our hearts have lost and we're suffering? This makes no sense. What's this guy talking about? The Beatitudes as beautiful as they may sound, or as sometimes you might see them stitched on, cross-stitched on, some, hung on somebody's door, or on the walls of a church, are really pretty difficult. As a peer of mine said, these aren't your grandma's beatitudes. And I think to myself, as I've read them as well, that these are some of the most misunderstood and I would venture to say some of the most misinterpreted of all the biblical texts. Sometimes we lose in translation from Greek to English some really important things. So if you join with me in digging into these Beatitudes a little, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but for example, let's start with the beginning. Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Now, from a baseline starting point, there are many Beatitudes in the Hebrew Bible with common conventional wisdom. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, for they will live long and prosperous lives. Uh, you'll see them in the Psalms. You'll see them in the Proverbs. Do this, and it'll go well for you. Here, Jesus is kind of reversing those. The world may say you're blessed if you're rich, powerful, and good-looking, but here's what God says matters in this kingdom of God. And in our Gospels, we have two sets of Beatitudes. Luke's, the Sermon on the Plain, where it's a level playing field, and everybody's on the same page. And Matthew, where it's a Sermon on a Mountain. And you say, well, we're the... Topographical guys not out surveying. I mean, who's right there? I mean, is it, is, it, is it a plain? Is it a mountain? Matthew's trying to link the readers and hearers of this gospel to Moses. Where did Moses give the commandments from? The mountain. Jesus is teaching from the mountain, reinterpreting the laws of God. So he adds, blessed are you who are poor. Luke just says, blessed are you who are poor. You don't have two pennies to rub together. You, you don't have any money. Blessed are you when you are impoverished because God sees you. God will be with you even when nobody else is. Matthew adds in spirit. So is Matthew saying figuratively it's more about a spiritual state than an economic or social state? Well, not so fast. There are two words in Greek for poor that are used. Penes, which means literally I'm broke. I don't have any money in my wallet or my purse or my bank account, and I'm struggling. But there's a, a stronger word for poverty, tokos, which means literally you're bent over. Physically, it's affecting you. It's a crippling, systematic poverty that is crushing you. You're destitute. You have no chance of getting out of this poverty without God, without somebody else being extremely generous. On your own, you have no hope. And so when Matthew uses, by the way, the same word for poor as Luke uses, and he says, blessed are you when you are poor in this crippling, crushing kind of spirit. Now that's, that's a little more teeth than 
Blessed are you when you look at somebody else and they know the Bible better than you or their prayer life's a little more robust than yours or you're struggling in that way. Yeah, we play those comparison games, but this is different what Matthew is writing, what Jesus is saying. Blessed are you when you're spiritually crushed. I think about in my own life when things, or I've experienced either personally or through ministry, things that have been spiritually crushing to me. Miscarriage of a child. Doctor saying, you're never going to be a father, at least not biologically. A kid gets shot on the street in a drive-by. I wake up and I read the news and it's depressing and I, I feel it's overwhelming and I feel small and who am I? To, what can I do in the face of such violence or, or cruelty in the world? I feel powerless and sometimes my spirit draws in and I feel crushed. And that's where Jesus goes right out of the gate in these beatitudes. Blessed are you when you're feeling crushed spiritually because God's got you. You don't serve some kind of weak God who doesn't care or is indifferent. God meets you when it hurts most. And you're not irreparably broken There's not something horribly wrong with you. You're a human being and you've experienced some of the the cruelties or harshness of life. So in my mind's eye, Jesus starts a sermon about by saying, let's be real with where we're at in our deepest vulnerabilities and spiritual hurts. Let's start there. You are beloved. And that word blessed, marikakos in Greek means beloved, treasured of God one of a kind before God. Let's keep going. Blessed are you who mourn. This is, if you've experienced a loss, in the message, Eugene Peters writes, blessed are you when you've lost everything and every one that you love dear so that you're open and know that you can draw nearer to the one who holds you most dear. Well, Yeah, that sounds nice, and there's a truth to that, but at the same time, if you've had a fresh loss in your life, if you've just buried somebody that you care about or love, that's crushing too. So what does Jesus say? Blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. And in my mind's eyes, when I read that in English, I think, all right, I'm in a a funeral home, and somebody's uh, telling me they're there for me, they bring me some meals, maybe they sit down on the couch and hold my hand, And it's comforting, yes. But that's not what the Greek word here means when it says comfort. It's not just some pithy platitude of somebody saying, "Ah, it'll get better over time. It's it's deeper than that. The word for comfort, I'm going to have to say this slowly, parakletheslei sonatai. It's all Greek to me. Try saying that five times fast. But that word, Paraklesenotai means, it's a courtroom term. And it comes from, in John's gospel, the paraclete, it's, a, it's an adjective for the Holy Spirit, a descriptor for the Holy Spirit. Somebody who is a paraclete is somebody who's a defense lawyer in a court of law. So what Jesus is saying with somebody who will comfort you, it's not just they're going to be there and say it's going to be okay over the long run. No, it's somebody who's going to advocate for you. So this is a very specific loss. Imagine you've lost a spouse who is the breadwinner of your family, who owns the house, who's been your only source of income, who's the glue that's kept your family together. They're gone. They've died. Blessed are you, Jesus says, because not only do you have a God who will draw alongside of you in the physical or emotional pain, but you have an advocate, a defense lawyer. Somebody's going to say to you and fight on your behalf and say, I'm not going to let you fall through the cracks having lost everything. I'm going to fight on your behalf. 
So when there's a mass shooting in Chicago streets and some toddler gets killed and we say our thoughts and prayers are with you, it's beyond just word service. It's saying, I'm going to get in the streets with you and try and get rid of this gang violence. I'm going to try to push so that this won't happen anymore to the children on your streets. It's a fighting defense and protection. It's got some teeth to it. Beyond, you'll be comforted. Personally, I like to know that Jesus is saying God's a lot more than just a comfort or security blanket, but an advocate, one who cares about injustice, one who cares for the widow who has lost everything. And remember that, remember that gospel story with the persistent widow on the judge? On, her, on, her, on the judge's door, and it's, finally, finally, I'll do something about it. That's the kind of advocacy and push that this beatitude is after. The third one that I'd like to take on is the one that I, I'll be honest with you, as a kid, as, as a high school student, when I read it, it's the one that bothered me most of all the blessings that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the meek. Now, what do you think of when you think of somebody who's meek? Anybody? I need some help here. Anybody? A wallflower. Thank you. Anybody else? Shrinking. A shrinking violet. Uh, me too. So when I thought about meekness in high school, I thought the, the meek kids are the kids who get bullied and pushed around. Meek on the lesser shadow side of it is often associated with weak. I mean... If you're picking teams for the dodgeball game in gym class, you want the meek kids on your team? Right? So meek has this connotation in English with timid, with avoidance of conflict. I'm going to keep my head down, keep quiet so I don't ruffle any, you know, make any waves. The Greek for meek is praus. It might surprise you to know that the most common use of prowess in Jesus' time was with the Roman legions and their cavalry, the training of their horse units. And what was prowess used to describe this gentle horse that they were training for battle? And the horse obviously is stronger than its rider, right? We use horsepower for engines, for cars, for boats. It's a strong animal. But if a horse is going into a battle with swords and catapults and spears, its first, its natural instinct is to flee, to run. Self-preservation. And the soldiers would train it, prowess, to be disciplined, to listen to the commands of its rider, to think less about self-preservation and to be one with the one commanding it, gentle but disciplined. Thinking not of itself or self-preservation, but of the two of them together. South African theologian Bill Domares says that if you look at the Greek word for meek praus and then take its Hebrew counterpart, anav, and you look at all the ways that this word is translated from the Hebrew Bible and used, nine times out of ten, the Hebrew word for meek is about God's people holding strong when they've been dispossessed of their land, the exile. To Babylon, when the rich in their avarice or greed have taken money and land from the poor farmers, the tax collectors of Jesus' time come knocking and taking away that which belongs to the family farm, and they're going to lose everything that they own and the land promised to them by God from the covenant when they've come into the land of promise. And Domaris says, isn't it powerful 
that Jesus says, blessed are you when you are meek, prowls. When you think less of yourself, you have this gentle conviction that listens to the voice of the one speaking to you, and you hold your ground no matter what anybody does to you or tries to take from you because you will inherit the earth. So the powerful, the high priests, the Romans, I mean, think about who Jesus is talking to. Most of them poor peasantry. Blessed are you when you're so aligned with the kingdom of God, no matter what's going on in the world around you, no matter what the world defines as power or value, and you hold true, gentle, and strong to your conviction, even if everything seems to be stripped away, you're still beloved of God, and that's still the right road in the kingdom to come that's here and now, but that's not yet. Does that make a difference? When you hear the Greek of meek, it does for me. That's a whole different planet than the common associations in the English that I find I grew up with hearing about meekness. That's a whole different ballgame. So when we hear these Beatitudes, and you're trying to figure out how do I navigate this world with the faith I seek to hold, the God I believe in, when so many days it doesn't feel very rewarding or it doesn't feel very blessed, at least in the ways that the world tells me I'm a success or a failure, don't always align with the kingdom of God. And what God says makes me successful in life. Where the currency isn't dollars or cents, but relationship. How we treat each other. How we live our lives when nobody else is looking. What we stand for, ultimately, with our God. Beloved, this Nazarene first century preacher says, you are beloved even when you haven't felt it, even when you felt kicked around, even when the world seems more violent than peaceable, short on grace and easy on judgment, I tell you, you are beloved of God and you are meant to live into these values, to hold them as God holds them and to never forget that God's got you. That's where he starts off his very first sermon. Can you imagine people hearing this for the first time? I think you and I can, because it's just, to the, just as tough today as it was for them to sometimes feel that treasuredness in a world that sometimes doesn't share those values. Beloved, you are blessed to be a blessing as you live out these kingdom values in this world today. Amen. Your spirit is willing, I invite you into this time of prayer. God of grace, God of joy and insight, steady us. Steady us in prayer. And may your mercy pour forth on us. For you are God known to us in deepening relationships. You are a God who continues the conversation. So may we welcome 
you and each other with courage. Knowing that being together changes who we are. And we pray. We pray to be transformed. Allowing an imbalance of power that will allow each one of us to more fully belong. God of community, grant that we can hold sacred silence so we can craft our listening to more fully hear your voice in our midst. God of grace, God of joy, God of insight. Steady us that our hearts can be centered on you. Whisper to us in our breathing, in our prayers, for those we love, for our families, for our friends, for our community, for our world. Lord, hear the silent prayers of our hearts. Creator of all that is seen and unseen, all that is known and unknown, healer of each wound, be the strength of those who tend to the body, to the mind, and to the spirit. Be that peace-filled presence that descends when we feel most troubled. Be the wisdom that will lead our conversations before we ever open our mouths. God of grace, God of joy, steady us. Open us that we will be open to you and unite us in one voice, one ministry and one mission as we speak the prayer you have taught all generations. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we invite our ushers to come forward, let us remember the joy, the hope, the life, and the abundance that we have been given. Not just the abundance of things, but you know, there's that. But the abundance, the abundance of joy that we have to share, the abundance of prayer, that we have to offer, the abundance for those who have it of time to offer to one another. Everything that we have is a gift from God. And so we offer back that which has been given to us. Let us keep it in perspective as we offer return 
to the one who has given us everything that we have. God loves a cheerful giver. God will take it when we're grumpy too. But God loves a cheerful giver. So let's pay attention to our perspective. stand for the singing of our doxology.
courage and God of challenge, pour your blessing upon these gifts and these gifts and these gifts that all may be used in unity according to your will, according to your way, that having been blessed, we may be blessings to those we meet, to those we know and those we may never know, because all are known to you, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, our greatest blessing is you. Amen. Please stay standing if you're able and join in singing our closing song, hymn number 666, Blessed Are They. The lyrics will also be on the screens. Blessed are they, the poor in spirit. I said I was only going to do a couple of the Beatitudes. One more, one more. Rome boasted of the Pax Romana, 200 years of peace. How is it achieved? Through Romans' military might. And Jesus has the audacity and courage to say, blessed are you, not because of the absence of war, but you who seek to be reconcilers, who make the first move to bring people together who haven't seen eye to eye or in conflict. Blessed are you when you go out in the world in keeping peace. Powerful marching orders. The last thing I wanted to say is it matters who's saying the blessing. Pastor Jim Selmerselt, who's a Baptist contemporary, said he could remember when his father, who rarely said words of praise, said, I'm proud of you. He counted on one hand, but because it was coming from his dad, it carried a lot more weight than if... You know, somebody else's parents on the sideline said, I'm proud of you. For you, that might be a coach, it might be a parent, it might be a brother or sister, it might be your spouse. Here, it's the Son of God. And he has the power to give the blessing because of who he is. You are beloved. 
Don't ever forget it. God sees you and God loves you. So you have strength to go out into the world no matter what and know you don't go alone. May the peace of Christ, the conviction of our hearts, and the love of God carry us until we see one another again. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Because of the meeting immediately after service, coffee will be served in the parlor instead of fellowship hall. We invite you to stay on your feet for our postlude, My Feet Are on the Rock. Thank you. Go enjoy some coffee and come right back for our meeting.